Information and Hayek. This is the first part of what may be a couple of videos critiquing Hayek and his information theoretic criticism of socialism. I'm perhaps giving too much credit to him by saying information theoretic since it's not information theoretic in a modern sense. When was this work done? I'm basically reporting on something done about 25 years ago in the mid 90s when I was employed at the Turing Institute and paid a visit to Professor Cotterell in the US where we jointly worked on the paper and it was published in 1997 in the journal critique of sorry the journal research in political economy why did we do it well we'd recently published towards a new socialism and felt that we had to produce a more serious theoretical refutation of the main voices or main theorists who were skeptical of socialism and for the influence of Hayek can be shown for example in um, another bourgeois economist Stiglitz and he was a critic a critic of socialist economics but his critique was almost entirely devoted towards market socialism now why was that well, he said, as for a centrally planned economy, Hayek had rightly criticised the Marxian project, arguing that the central planner could never have the requisite information. So another leading economist didn't even bother arguing against a planned economy because he felt Hayek had already refuted the idea of a planned economy. And this was a fairly typical response. Even economists who didn't subscribe to Stiglitz's extreme pro-market uh, views nonetheless believed that Hayek's critique of central planning was definitive. Now I'm first going to run through at some length Hayek's own arguments. He argued that the true economic problem was securing the best use of resources for social purposes and he said this is often misunderstood due to what he called naturalism or scientism which he claimed transferred natural science habits of thought to social science now this point this critique of scientism is something you'll find many left liberal or supposedly left-wing uh, writers echo Hayek claimed to differ from the socialists only over whether planning sh should be central by the state or divided among individuals. The latter, he said, involves market competition where decentralised planning occurs. And he said the efficiency of socialist planning versus market decentralised operations depended on whether a single central authority can efficiently distribute knowledge. So what does he say the economic problem is? It's maximising the use of resources and this is a logic problem if you have a complete knowledge of means and systems of preferences. And he says the solution must satisfy certain conditions such as equal marginal rates of substitution between commodities and factors. Now this is a very neoclassical definition of the economic problem. Um, and But giving that as it may, Hayek said this is not the economic problem that society really faces as the data used in economic calculation cannot be given to a single mind and knowledge of the circumstances facing the economy is dispersed among individuals. So this thrust is essentially against people like Langer, the market socialists 
or semi-market socialists. As I say, the socialist calculation debate in the mid-20th century uh, focused on neoclassical socialists and critics of socialists rather than on Marxists. Uh, so the definition of the problem structure comes from neoclassical economics and this is where this emphasis on individual preferences comes from. Marxist economics is not so concerned with individual preferences. It's not built up as a theory of individual preferences. We say that the practical problem is aligning production potential with social needs. And these social need patterns are determined through democratic political decisions and to some extent through aggregate consumer purchases. But there's no need to refer to unknown schedules of preferences that individuals have. Now, an important part of Hayek's knowledge theory is that he distinguishes between scientific knowledge, which he says handles general laws, and what he terms unorganised knowledge, which is knowledge specific to circumstances of time and place, knowledge specific to the man on the spot. Scientific knowledge, he says, can be centralised through a body of experts, but unorganised knowledge is unique and can only be used with individual or active cooperation. Now this is the, the thrust of the Hayekian anti-planning argument. <clears throat> and as an, <clears throat> as an example, he gave this specialised localised knowledge which he said shipping clerks and arbitrageurs had. Now this seems very anachronistic by modern standards. But he says this type of knowledge, this specific knowledge, is often undervalued by those who view general scientific knowledge as the paradigm of knowledge. Now, another thing which Hayek is constantly talking about is the rate at which things change is. And he says that the advocates and critics of planning differ in how important changes are. Um, he says that if uh, detailed economic plans could be laid out in advance and closely adhered to, the task of creating a comprehensive plan wouldn't be too difficult. Um, but... He argues that economically relevant change occurs very frequently and at discrete intervals and on a long scale, making the management of productive systems a very difficult task. Now, stepping aside from what Hayek himself actually said, you have to ask how much of these changes are changes generated internally by the capitalist business cycle by fluctuations which are entirely internal to financial movements and how much of them are changes induced by technology because only the latter would be relevant for, for the long-term planning in a social system. <coughs> and he's constantly thinking in terms of capitalist managers. So he talks about the problems of cost control <coughs> in competitive industries and the need to make day-to-day -day decisions in the light of unpredicted circumstances. Well, in some industries that's true, but many industries have to work on the basis of long-term plans. And he says central planning cannot directly account for these circumstances uh, which since they necessitate decisions being made on the, sh the spot. Well, I would question that. The <coughs> He's full of praise for the price system. He says it's not absolutely perfect in the sense of general equilibrium theory, but 
what happens with the price system is nonetheless, as he puts it, a marvel of economic coordination. And he says that the economic problem consists in extending resource utilization beyond one person's control and providing incentives for lots of people to do desirable things without guidance. This is, of course, rehashing the invisible hand. And he says the price system is a form of division of labor that has allowed for coordinated resource utilization based on equally divided knowledge and that there's no alternative system which can preserve the features of the existing situ system such as individual freedom in choosing pursuits and knowledge and skills. Well this is very much the standpoint of a privileged person because the degree of individual freedom in choosing pursuits and knowledge and skills faced by most people in the capitalist econ economy is quite limited. Another thing is that he's constantly assuming outdated technology. Now, our criticisms of Hayek in the 90s um, took advantage of things that have been known since Hayek wrote. And it might be said this is unjustified, but we think it is justified because he thought he was putting forward very general arguments and he didn't expect to see these undermined by technology within his lifetime. And indeed, Hayek's followers continue to reiterate arguments he put forward in the 1940s as if nothing has happened, as if the developments of information technology since the 1940s are of no significance. Another thing which is very evident in Hayek and the Austrian school is subjectivism. He has a claim that social science is different from physical science because it has to deal with an irreducible subjective element of human behaviour and that society must be understood in terms of human conscious actions and any collective phenomena arises out of the unintended outcome of lots of individual actors. And he says this means there's something very different between social science and natural science. And whilst it's reasonable that an individual scientist in the natural science field can have all the relevant information to make predictions, in the social science context this a priori cannot happen because human subjectivity is not, he says, available for scientific investigation. Now, how, how does this stand with respect to historical materialism? Well, historical materialism and economist physics, for that matter, agree with Hayek that market economies exhibit unintended outcomes. But we claim that conscious decisions are not relevant to this. We claim that the capitalist economy is subject to aggregate statistical laws, statistical laws of motion, which are indeed independent of human consciousness. And it is the study of these laws of motion that political economy should concern itself with. And the fact that the capitalist economy is subject to laws, that these, that it has a law governed behaviour, is what makes Marxian economics analogous to natural science. Now, it may be objected that a capitalist economy is chaotic. But this is not fundamentally different from a lot of physical systems. For example, turbulent flows are chaotic. And that doesn't mean that the flow of water is not law governed you get natural systems which have a large number of degrees of freedom. And if they have some linkages which are non-linear, then their long-term dynamics can be chaotic. 
for instance, even something as deterministic as orbital dynamics, something archetypically Newtonian, can result in long-term chaotic orbits. Not in the sense that orbits will go wild anywhere, but behaviour that makes long-term predictions of the positions of the planet extremely difficult. And that's because the law of gravity is a non-linear law. So Hayek's contrast between predictions made by physical science and natural science are false because it's not the case that all physical scientists have all the information they require or that social scientists must lack the information they require. Again, take other physical systems like weather forecasting. Um, Long-term prediction beyond a week or two isn't possible because the dynamics of meteorology at a fine level are chaotic. And the same applies to any social phenomena. Prediction in detail is difficult because the system has a large number of degrees of freedom, not because of subjectivity. Any system with a large number of degrees of freedom is difficult to predict. But that doesn't mean that you can't make general, testable statements. Whilst weather forecasting is difficult, you can make strong predictions. For instance, you can predict that if greenhouse gas concentrations double, average Earth temperatures will rise by more than two degrees. Now that is a strong prediction made by climate modelers. I set two degrees centigrade as well below the lower limit that they predict. Most of them predict well above two degrees. You can make similar strong predictions about capitalist economy. As Marx says, the wealth of capitalist society presents itself as an immense accumulation of commodities. But we can go beyond that and say this immense accumulation of commodities is such that the correlation between sectoral prices and sectoral labour values will exceed 0 0.85. Now, that you can drive these as statistical laws was established by Fajun and Makova in their book, A Probabilistic Approach to Political Economy. More generally, you can't start out with the subject because the rational subject's not a given category. Neurophysiology, as shown by Dennett, indicates that people act first and then become aware of their intention afterwards. They rationalize why they did something. And in general, human behavior is highly routinized and governed by unconscious brain functions. And in economics, the actual subjects are more juridical than personal. They're firms, the subjects in the economy. And their actions result from routinized practices in their offices. Reviews and decision-making procedures that involve lots of people. So calling these subjects is wrong. Subjects are firms. Now, in the early stages of capitalism, the distinction between a personal and a juridical subject was unclear because most firms were sold, sing, owned by single persons and therefore there was a confusion in the mind of commentators between whether a subject was an economic category generated by the firm or whether it's a psychological category. However, in current economic development, insofar as there's a, a juridical subject, a rational calculating subject, it's the property maximizing firm. And Hayek initially aimed to distinguish economics as a moral philosophy branch, but once 
the subject is recognised as an organisational construct, his exclusion of science from economics becomes untenable. This is a, a point we, we elaborate on in the book Defending Materialism. Now let's look at information and what information is. As I said, his um, philosophical standpoint is subjectivist and his arguments against socialist planning rely heavily on this. And he was writing in the early 50s or late 40s after the establishment of scientific information theory. And whilst he took some cognizance of early neural net theory, he took no cognizance of information theory. His approach remains pre-scientific. The objectivity of information, treating information as something objective, has revolutionized biology, it's re revolutionized major industries and social ideologies, and is central to many areas of physics as well. And this invalidates the whole approach of, of Hayek. For him, information is essentially subjective, knowledge in people's mind. And he highlights the difficulty of combining subjective knowledge for the common good and says only markets can do this. But he never discusses the technical supports that were required to do this. How was it done? How was information manipulated and transmitted? The point is that any class society where you have relations of exploitation has to have some technology of record, stabilizing things like landlord and tenant relations. All of this requires means of recording ownership and tenancy contracts, for example. The categories of bourgeois economics all depend on technologies of information. And for modern science, as I say, information is objective. It's measurable. It's measured in terms of prob probability theory or, or, or algorithmics. And it's always material. It can exist in DNA. It can exist in binary code. It can exist in alphabetic text. It can exist in radio waves. But every time it exists, it's a configuration of matter and not something subjective. Now, you, because of his subjectivist approach, he poses the issue of planning in terms of whether one mind can comprehend all the things required for running an economy. Um, he and Mises talk about the director with carrying over the concept of a firm's director to a director of a socialist economy. And they question whether a single mind could improve on the millions of cogitations carried out in the market. But it's not our aim as socialists to have a single mind controlling things. Instead, we propose replacing market information processing with economic information processing within planning organisations and with, within which, in the future, the information processing will in large part be done by machines, not by human beings, because that is the nature of even capitalist economy now. I mean, God's plan was not one individual. The information it handled was not in one person's mind. It was held in ledgers, paper and pencil spreadsheets, type letters, reports, etc. Indeed, his idea of concentrating information in a single mind really relates to pre-civilized society. The development of economic administration right from the earliest stages of civilization 
depended on means of calculation and record, writing and numeral systems. It wasn't a mental operation. The human mind was needed to make the initial records and people then applied entirely routinized arithmetic procedures, procedures they'd learned by rote to process the information. Now instead of humans using rote arithmetic, we delegate that to our arithmetic machines. Now let's look at this issue of distributed local knowledge and knowledge known only to the man on the spot, which meant he claimed planning was impossible. And the example he gave was of shipping clocks. Well, ironically, it's this local knowledge that has been the most comprehensively digitised and automated. And it was some of the first. It started with his very first example. Air and sea ticketing were some of the first systems to be automated in the 1960s. The first computer myself and Greg Michelson had um, was a surplus Burroughs computer from the Bodicea system built for BOAC's ticketing in the 1960s. Economic knowledge is all now objective. Let's move from a 707 to an A340. Nobody knows how to build an A340. No person knows how to do it. The com component database is all computerized, all mechanized. The construction process for each step is spelled out in online manuals. The quality controls procedures are spelled out and specified and monitored online and we know what happens when this specified set of routines fails or is not adhered to by human beings that was obvious with Boeing with the doors flying off planes when they stopped adhering to these routines or failed to adhere to these routines Now, Hayek and pro-market people are strong on the idea that decentralised decision-making is best. I want to look at that in terms of the different forms of information processing that occur in an economy. Basically, there are three aspects in a capitalist economy, three aspects. Modelling the real flows of goods modelling property relations and, and this was the thing which concerned Hayek, examining different potential uses of goods. Now these are actually very different. Modelling the real flow of goods is done by standardised forms, order forms, delivery notes, stock taking etc. And all these functions can be done just as readily in a socialist economy because they relate entirely to material use values. But in parallel with that, a capitalist economy has to maintain a whole second system of information. It has to maintain records of the changes in property which occur consequent on the moves, movement of goods. For this there's, there are other documents. There are invoices, checks, receipts, financial accounts. Now this kind of information flow isn't needed in a communist system. The communist system is only concerned with the movement of material goods, not with the changes in property. But examining different potential uses of goods is something very different. It's not a property of the real economy. It's a property of the phase space of possible economies. A part of the economic problem as conceived of by bourgeois economics, which bourgeois economics conceives it 
in terms of these possible alternative uses. But in a market economy, the real economy's evolution is the search procedure to examine the phase space. The economy describes a trajectory through this phase space. Uh, influenced by individual economic agents, yes, but this trajectory is unique. The whole economy acts as a single analog processor with the price vector determining its position in the economic problem space. And because it's single threaded like that, its ability to search through this phase space is limited. And it's a very slow process. The process operates with a very slow cycle time due to the price change rate. The price change rate depends on the changes in the production of real goods. And changes in the production of real goods involve building new factories. So the market economy is something which is performing in what in computer science terms is a single threaded search through its state space. Adjustments are bound to be slow because they're determined by the real economy's movement. And this is also very wasteful. It's the reason why you have the chaotic crises and cycles in a capitalist economy. Nowadays, with computers, you can have precognition. A computerized plan can know what would happen, and it can do this by using huge supercomputers to perform multi threaded searches through the phase space of what the economy could do in the future. And the interconnection between sections will have been modeled extensively before the first ground is cut for a new factory or a new plant. The real movement of the economy is no longer your method of computation. You compute with models first, so that you're not groping blindly in the dark. This will be continued.